everyone in Facebook land. Uh, my name is Paul Chance and I am the Senior Product Marketing Manager for the WFM Solutions here at NICE. And with me today is Paul Lehman. Uh, Paul runs the back office team. And so Paul, why don't you uh, introduce yourself for us? Sure. Thanks, Paul. Sure. Paul Lehman. Hi, Facebook. Happy to be with you today on this Friday. And I'm Director of our back office solutions. And uh, when I'm not doing work, I enjoy traveling and doing some outdoor activities. So that's a little, little about me. That's great. That's great. You mentioned you're over back office, so I'm going to ask the really dumb question. What do you mean by back office? Sure. It's a great question. You know, uh, our customers know us for being a contact center uh, provider of, of advanced solutions, right? Mm -hmm. But we also have those same advanced solutions in the back office or business operations part of your company. And so that's where these people work and they're not in the contact center but they're doing things such as processing claims, processing loans, and maybe doing billing, depending on what kind of mm -hmm. business you're in. So typically there's a lot of people there doing uh, you know, similar work. And while they might you know, take some calls, make some calls, they're not typically on an ACD, not in, in a contact center. And uh, you know, we can help those, those people with our solutions as well. Great. Now, I understand you, you have some interesting data to share with us from a, a new benchmark study that you've done. Yes, we have an exciting study and some great data. And uh, first, let me set the stage a little bit for you, right? That would be great. So in the back office, a couple of the key objectives are, you know, how do I get the work done at the lowest cost? And how do I get it done quickly so that I have good customer satisfaction, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem can be that it's really difficult to understand you know, who's working hard and who's hardly working, right? So it's difficult because there's not an easy way to track how much time, uh, you know, people are doing productive work, right? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. In a typical eight hour day, which these people are working, you know, taking, uh, taking away, accounting for breaks and lunches, uh, Paul, how much time do you think is reasonable for these people to be not working? You know, when you when you add up the the time walking to the break room or you know walking by some cubicles and saying hi, how's your kids? How did the sports team go last night? Probably 30, 40 minutes. Sure. Yeah. So that sounds totally reasonable, right? But what we found in this benchmarking study, we have worked with forty companies across the globe, right? Every different kind of business vertical, right? Mm -hmm. And on average, what we find is that of an eight-hour day there's 108 minutes that are not being worked, okay? And so we do this, but we track every second of the day what they're doing on their PC, right? Or even if they're on their PC, but what applications they're in, what websites they're going to, and then we work with the customer to categorize that, right? We categorize it into work time, not work time. So 108 minutes on average every day. So, okay, I'm putting this back in my simple language here. So you're telling me that over an hour and a half a day that the company's paying us to work, they're not working. That's correct. And it's on average, every employee for every day. That's almost un unbelievable. Yeah, it, it, it is. And many of our customers that have gone through this with us, you know, initially didn't want to believe the numbers, right? They're like, something's incorrect, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not incorrect, right? So we, we do, prove that out to them right and yeah. so so we can we can show them really what's going on you know they have this kind of belief that their teams have more capacity to do more work than they, they right. think they do but right. they really don't have a way to to prove that or to measure it and you know that's sort of the the old adage if you can't measure it you can't manage it right <laughs> okay I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this so how how does it happen where people it, nobody notices that people aren't working for an hour and a half a day. Yeah. So, well, number one, it's not like they're, you know, abandoning their desk all day and not looking busy. That's true. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so they are looking busy. And, you know, what happens in the back office is there is a thing called a time standard that is the average amount of time it should take to complete a certain type of work. And the, the management team will actually do time and motion studies, they will sit with people with a stopwatch and a clipboard, literally watch a few people for a few days, and they will track the average amount of time that it takes to do this work, right? 
But what our customers will tell us is that, um, you know, they don't get a large sampling of that. Um, they just don't have the time to do it. They don't have the time to track everybody every day, every second, which our software can do, but they, they can't do that. So, so the people that are working, you know, they're not necessarily working uh, slower, but they're not going to work fast, right? And what our customers also tell us is that, um, you know, people that have been doing the work in promoter to management, they would say, you know what, I would work really hard in the beginning part of my day, you know, yes. and get most of my work done, and then I can make the afternoon very easy, right? Right. In fact, there's a an adage from the 50s called Parkinson's Law, and it's the adage that the work expands to fill the time allotted to complete, right? And right. so if these time standards, you get those and you know that I have to do 30 work items a day, right, mm -hmm. or so many hours, then you know what you have to hit to meet your goal, and you can do that. You can, you know, get the work done very quickly in the beginning part of your day, and then uh, kind of coast in the afternoon. Paul, there's got to be a tremendous ROI for this. If, if you can even save a portion, 50% of that 108 minutes you're talking about, that's got to be an astronomical ROI. You're absolutely right, Paul. So the uh, the numbers and the math works out right. So we do exactly what you're saying. We assume, you know what, you can, uh, let's be conservative. Let's say you save half of the 108 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can save 54 minutes a day, still huge for every person in your organization every day. That works out to roughly about a million dollars in savings for every 200 people year over year, right? Mm -hmm. That's huge. Okay. Sorry, Paul. I tend to be a little bit of a skeptic sometimes. Why, why am I not surprised? <laughs> and, and being from Missouri, you're going to have to show me because this sounds too good to be true. Okay. I get it, right? So, um, what I would say to you or any skeptics out there listening is, is this, you know, this again is not one or two companies in you know, a certain mm -hmm. part of the world, a certain business line, right? This is 40 companies we survey uh, all across the globe, different businesses. But okay, so let's say you want to be more conservative. We also know that the standard deviation on that 108 minutes of non-work time is 44 minutes, right? So that gives us a good range that we can work from. So, okay. So that means that minimally you might have 64 minutes, right? Uh, of of non-work time on, on the low end. If you're a really well-run organization, right? Where they are mm -hmm. tracking maybe a little bit of what people are doing. But on the other side, you know, that's 44 more minutes to the 108. So you have 152 minutes to get worse, right? Then, then you have even more opportunities. So we see both. So so if you're going to be skeptical, that's fine. We can look yeah. at the low end, but also realize there's a high end as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's do the math, right? So if you can save half of the 64 minutes, you can save 32 minutes, again, per person per day. That's still about $300,000 uh, yeah. in savings a year for every 100 employees. Right, and if I can save half of the 152, right, that's 700k, right, every year right. for 100 employees. And so, okay, let's say you want to be more conservative than that, you know, uh, fine. Say it's say you can save 250k uh, per 100 people. Mm -hmm. That's still a million dollars a year for 400 people, right? Still that's still a huge ROI, and yeah. you'll see that in our case study. You know, we're being uh, in, in the benchmark state, we're being fairly conservative with that, but mm -hmm. it's still a huge number, right? There's a lot of savings to be gained. You know, I really like how you, you actually have empirical data to back this stuff up. Yep. And that helps me overcome my skepticism. Sure. These are big numbers, but you, you've, you know, talked to 40 different customers and done the analysis. Yeah. So it's hard to, you know, argue with the, with the, the numbers. Data, the data doesn't the, lie, The right? data doesn't lie, exactly. So can you share any stories from customers' successes? Yeah, you know, we hear a lot of great stories from our customers, and, and there's one in particular that I love. This is a, a, a customer that put our solutions into many of their back office departments, and they had one department where uh, they had 130 full-time people. They were struggling to get the work done. Um, they were scheduling overtime because they couldn't get the work done on time, right? And they put on our solutions, and before they rolled the data out on dashboards to the to the employees, 
they took a look at some of the data. And interestingly enough, they found that their best employees were working really fast. They were getting their work done in four hours, okay? And then they started to kind of discreetly survey what they were doing the other four hours of the day, right? Well, they were socializing with some of their coworkers, right? Which is great, That's we, we all like that socialization time. But that ended up slowing down the people that weren't the fastest workers, right? And so in some regards, you love the fastest people are getting a lot of work done. You're hurting other people. But they're hurting the other teams, right? Yeah. So so then you turn it on and you let them see their data for a couple months. And Paul, what do you think happened? I don't know, but I'm excited to find out. Yeah, so they drained their queue. They literally drained their queue. They got done with all of the work that was coming in. Mm -hmm. And they found out that they didn't need 130 people. They certainly didn't need any overtime to be scheduled. They could get all the work done on time with 85 people. Wow. Now, they didn't want to let you know the people go. So what they did is they cross-trained a team of this group and sent them over to another group that was struggling. And our software gave them insight into how to better cross-train people, right, and to um, multi-skill them so they can be even more optimized and more efficient. This, this sounds great, but the devil's always in the detail. You know, I'm still a little bit of the, how is this being done? Sure, sure. So, um, you know, that's that's what we do. One of the things we do is to shine a light and, and mm -hmm. visibility, right? So we have part of the software suite is uh, a component that runs on the, the Windows PC, tracks every second of the day, what application are you in, what website are you in, and, and stores that, and then we allow the customer to categorize that into what's work time, what's non-work time, right? We also track when they lock their PC or their PC's idle, meaning, uh, you know, minutes gone by and they haven't mm -hmm. typed on the keyboard or moved the mouse, those kind of things. So now we have this great set of data. We work with the customer to categorize it, right? So it is, uh, do you consider Outlook productive time, you know, your email productive time or not? Um, mm -hmm. And so we put that into, this is productive work, this is non-work but maybe business, right? So it could be you're putting in your vacation time. And this is non-work, which is maybe fantasy football, maybe, which is uh, just starting, just starting, right? Mm -hmm. And so and so then we can track the, uh, the employees over their day. And, and that's good, that's good for, supervisors but you don't really move the needle until you start showing this to the employees every day so what we find is if, if I'm a worker that you know was only working half a day and I get to see that on the screen and I know my manager sees it and oh by the way I get ranked within my group all of a sudden people start self-correcting very quickly right, right. I mean you, you'll have a goal for this and you'll set a goal and you'll coach and manage but a lot of it really uh, is self-improvement on their own because they know they they're not you know working yeah. like they need to. And so, yeah. um, going back a little bit to the story of the, the group that only need 85 people, um, they also found out their time standards that we talked about earlier were too long, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were able to shorten those up as well. So you know the solution gives you that kind of data as well to give you better visibility into what's going on. I love the fact that we're getting some visibility to actually what's going on. Yeah. You know, it's been kind of a black hole yes. for a lot yes. of years. Yes. Uh, but it, I have to admit, this kind of sounds like Big Brother coming in and kind of watching over your shoulder. How do companies deal with that? It's it's a great question. You're right. There is a little bit of that feel, right? And so uh, culture change is very important when you put in a solution like this. Mm -hmm. We have consultants that can help with that. Many times customers will bring in uh, people in their organization that can help with the culture change. So, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, rules of thumb around that where we can help you uh, make sure that your employees are on board, they understand what you're measuring, why you're measuring, and how you're gonna use the data. HR is on board, legal, the whole, the whole thing, right? But ultimately, Everyone agrees that you should be able to get a fair day's work done by your employees for a fair day's pay, right? right. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, the solution gives you insight, especially as a supervisor, of how to coach your employees, how to improve them, right? Mm -hmm. And if you are being more uh, 
optimized, right? You're doing work at a lower cost, your company's profitability is going up, your job stability is higher, right? Your uh, career growth is better. So there's a lot of good things for the employees as well. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you know, what about the stars, Paul? What about the stars that are working hard, getting more work done and higher quality, right? If you don't know that some of your people are only working half a day, my guess is you probably don't know that some of your stars are out there working really, really hard. And are you rewarding them accordingly? So let's talk about that a little bit. So okay. you have these these guys are these these people that are working and they're working really hard. These are your high producing people. How do you keep them engaged and continue that exceptional work? It's a great question. So we recommend if you don't already have it, putting in a pay for performance plan, right? It could be a monthly bonus, a quarterly bonus based upon the metrics and our solution can serve up the metrics and dashboards and reports so that that's calculated mm -hmm. for you, right? So, you know, if you have employees that are doing more work at a higher quality, why not reward them financially, right? Because mm -hmm. they're kind of earning their keep a little more than right. others, right? Right. So this is really awesome. I like it. Uh, so I see how the employees, how the management, how the company overall really is enjoying the benefits of the higher employee satisfaction yes. and higher productivity. Yes. Uh, what other trends do you see going on in the back office? You know, there's a, another trend to share work with the contact center. So bringing this back around to NICE's roots, right? And it makes sense. Um, and let, let me explain why it makes sense in a number of mm -hmm. areas, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, in the contact center, you typically have a peak mid-morning and another peak mid-afternoon, right? And those can be difficult to staff to because you know when you staff to those, you're going to have some overstaffing in the middle of the day, right? That you just have more people than you need, and you're you're paying more than you need to. And so there's also um, a bit of variety you can give your people. So if you take a small percentage of your contact center people and your back office people, and they have to be. Uh, the right skilled people, right? They have to have the phone skills, right? They're good on the phone, but also for the back office work, they have to be good on the PC. Then this can be a benefit and a reward to the, your top performers because it breaks up their day and gives them some variety of work, right? So if I'm not on the phone all day, I get some downtime doing back office work. I like that, that's great. Or if I'm you know, not socializing or talking to anybody, I'm heads down working all day, being able to talk on the phone is a nice break, right? So, so that's very helpful. So you can take, you know, you can optimize your, your workforce management or your workforce across the content center back office and save even more money, right? The challenge though, is that it can be very complex to, to schedule that, right? So you need yeah. uh, to be able to do that. You need a common workforce management system that has everybody you know, every employee defined in it with their skills, their availability. You know, from a forecasting perspective, how much uh, demand you have for both the context center work and the back right. office work. And you can let the solution do the hard work of optimization. So, so we see that happening more and more. And in fact, we see a lot of our contact center customers in WFM extending their WFM to the back office. It, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. I think this has been really, really helpful for our audience, and where can people go to find more information, Paul? So certainly look at nice.com. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of information there on the back office uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. Also, we have a YouTube channel, um, YouTube channel where we have some hands-on videos, and we'll post a link in the comments here uh, after the, the live session where you can go see an overview um, of our back office solutions. And then uh, soon we'll have the benchmarking paper up on nice.com. So that's www.nice.com. And uh, you can get more information there. I'd also say the, you know, the ROI here is great. So uh, give your account exec a call and schedule a demo. And we can also help you build your business case, right? To, to take, you know, improve your operations by 10, 15 percentage points and uh, really pay for the solution. Great. Thanks a lot. And thanks everyone for watching today's Facebook Live with Nice. Have a good day.